Good morning. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm uh, David Berto. I'm the director of our National Security Program on Industry and Resources here, and it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all this morning. I also want to welcome our viewers on the web, our viewers on C-SPAN, uh, Pentagon, and so on. For those in the room, I'd like to remind you to turn off your cell phones and other noisemakers. Uh, those on the video end can do whatever you want. We can't hear you. Um, and in fact, uh, when we get to the question period, uh, I want to remind you in the room, we're going to be using note cards and write down your questions. If you didn't bring a writing implement, let me know. We can get you one. We write a lot here. We're a think tank, but we're also a write tank. So we do a lot of writing. Um, those of you on the web can email me your questions at dberto at csis.org. That's D-B-E-R-T-E-A-U, Berto like plateau or chateau, at csis.org. And uh, we'll use your questions depending on how good they are. Um, it's a great privilege to have here this morning with us General Hawk Carlisle. General Carlisle is the commander of the Pacific Air Forces. He's got a long and distinguished Air Force career, graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1978. He's commanded at every level, squadron, uh, group, wing, numbered Air Force, uh, done a number of rough assignments, including, astonishingly, two as a legislative liaison uh, with the U.S. Congress, which I would think is about the most dangerous and un uh, difficult assignments that we can give an Air Force officer these days. In addition, he's attended both Maxwell's, uh, the Air War College, at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama, and the National Security Management course at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs. I had the privilege of running that program when then Colonel Carlisle was a star student uh, at, the, at the Maxwell School. So we've asked him uh, to uh, present here this morning. Then we're going to turn it over in a dialogue with, uh, with him and Dr. Michael Green. Dr. Green is our uh, Japan chair and the senior vice president of our Asia team here. Um, and then we'll take questions from the floor. And uh, myself and uh, Zach Cooper, our senior fellow for, uh, for Asia, will also uh, monitor these questions and feed our own as well, in case you don't ask any. Uh, although I look out at this audience, I don't think we're going to have any trouble coming up and filling the time with questions here this morning, sir. So without any uh, further ado, let me ask you to join me in welcoming General Hawk Carlisle. Thanks. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Hopefully everybody can hear okay in the back. So thanks. I appreciate the opportunity, David. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thanks for having me here. I know the chief talked here just uh, a little while ago, I think a month or a month and a half or so ago. Uh, so uh, I will try to, I know he covered Air Force at large. I'm going to talk significantly about uh, the Asia Pacific. And to be honest, I think I probably have not changed a slide. It should really say Indo-Asia Pacific. And, and in the Pacific AOR and, and certainly with PACOM, uh, Sam Lockler and myself and, and all the components, we always talk Indo-Asia Pacific. The term we cop often use is we kind of cover from Hollywood to Bollywood and from penguins to polar bears because we have both the Arctic and the Antarctic and then, of course, the Alaska coast California uh, to the India-Pakistan border. The other thing I'd like to thank uh, uh, Michael and David for is uh, asking me to present here after must -ask March was over. Um, <laughs> mine was embarrassing. I openly admit that. There are pictures. I've tried to burn them all. I haven't been successful, but... Uh, uh, we really, uh, I did not do well. Uh, so I, I appreciate uh, not having to have that when I was here. Some people haven't quite figured that out yet, David. <laughs> um, it, you know, uh, th this topic, I'll, I'll, I'll do a couple things here, but I'm really looking forward to your questions. And uh, I believe, uh, I, and I truly believe, the time I've spent out there and the amount of time I've spent in the Pacific, which is a greater portion of my career, is this really is the Pacific century for the United States. I, it's been used before. I know Secretary Clinton said it a couple of times. That it was even used in a, a PBS special back in the late 90s. Uh, but it really is the Asia-Pacific Asia century for the United States. And it's uh, for a variety of reasons. I think everybody pretty much knows them. The importance of the Asia-Pacific to the future of the United States I don't think can be overstated, whether it's the economic, the trade ties. It's everything that is incorporated as part of that. Um, things as simple as a simple as a TPP that is not necessarily simple, but Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, just the size of the economies that are uh, addressed in the Asia-Pacific region. Five largest economies, obviously, in the world: the United States, China, uh, Japan, India. It's close, and then Russia. Uh, that alone speaks to the volume of uh, importance. Also, the trade 
the amount of commerce that goes through there, uh, and then the challenges we face there. So as I go through that, I'll, uh, I'll try to cover all those things in the way that, uh, that makes sense to folks, and I will try to make this work. Next slide. Um, so as I said, uh, what I'll do to start with, I'll kind of do a one over the AOR here, and uh, we're not there yet. We were there. Okay, so I fly airplanes for a living, and, <laughs> and I can't work a clicker. Um, so I'll tell you what, we'll leave it here. Hopefully we'll get to the next slide soon, but I'll kind of do one over the AOR. Uh, so some of the issues that we're dealing with, it, it, and we'll kind of start up in the Northeast Asia and work our way down. Uh, <laughs> how am I doing so far? We'll work our way down to farther south and west as we go through this. So starting up in the Northeast Asia portion, Certainly what's going on in uh, Ukraine and Crimea is a challenge for us, uh, and it's a challenge for us in the Asia Pacific as well as, uh, as Europe. I had a conversation uh, about a week and a half ago with uh, Phil Breedlove for about two hours. He's not having a lot of fun, as you might imagine, but uh, uh, what Russia is doing in Ukraine and Crimea has a direct effect on what's happening in the Asia Pacific. Some of the things we've seen is our long-range aviation and the increase in that, those areas depicted in uh, green. Uh, they've come with their long-range aviation out to coast of California. They circumnavigated Guam. That uh, picture there is an F-15 intercept and a bear that had uh, flown down to Guam. Uh, the number of uh, LRA long-range aviation patrols that have gone around uh, the Japanese islands as well as around Korea have increased drastically, and there have been a lot more on the way of ship activity as well. It's a combination of things. It's to demonstrate their capability to do it. It's to gather intel, obviously, and in cases like full legal and the exercise we participate with both the Japanese and, and Republic of Korea. So a significant amount of increase in the activity from Russia in the Asia Pacific, and uh, we relate a lot of that to what's going on in the Ukraine. I think North Korea, everybody's pretty well versed in uh, the things that have happened from uh, the nuclear test, the threat of another nuclear test, what they're doing at Pyongyang now. Uh, what they've done uh, with restarting all their reactors, uh, what they've done with their missile program, the KN-08, the intercontinental ballistic missile they're trying to develop. Uh, their, their launches, uh, missile launches and space launches, uh, the, the execution of uh, uh, Jang Song Tech and that entire family and the purge within that government. Obviously, I will tell you that talking to uh, Scap Scaparati and Sam Locklear and I and all the components, uh, that, that uh, string for tension in the Korean Peninsula is truly as tight as it's ever been. And it's, uh, it appears to be getting worse uh, to us and to continue to be more and more of a challenge for us. As we work down, obviously, uh, there's a couple things that have happened in the East China Sea. One is the East China Sea ADIS declared by China. Uh, there's uh, a challenge with that for uh, three main reasons for the United States and our friends and partners in the region. The first challenge, obviously, is was done with no consultation of any of the nations in close proximity. Uh, they didn't talk to the Japanese. They didn't talk to the Republic of Korea. They didn't talk to anybody. They just developed it. So that was the first thing. Second thing was the rules to operate within that aid is do not follow international <coughs> law. They don't fa follow IKO. Uh, there's rules that are not consistent with international norms. And finally, as part of their declaration of that aid is they, there was an undefined threat. Uh, basically, it says you follow our rules and you do what we tell you to do within that aid is. We have the right to use special defensive measures. Nobody's defined that, um, but that uh, is laying out there. So the East China Sea and the uh, declaration of that aid is is a challenge. You also have the potential for either a Yellow Sea aid is and a South China Sea aid is, which uh, we imagine they're thinking about or maybe in the future at some point, but uh, again, we've been very open with us and our allies talking about how that, that, that is not a good idea and that they need to do, if they're going to do anything like that, it has to be in consultation with their neighbors in other countries. Senkakus, uh, there is a point also in that ADIS where all three ADIS overlap. I think most folks know that there's a triangle where the Republic of Korea, Japan, and, and the China ADIS all overlap. Underneath that is Sokaka Rock, which is a disputed uh, territory between the China and the Republic of Korea. We have the Senkakus, which is uh, disputed between China, Japan, and Taiwan. Obviously, all those little starbursts down there, all the different uh, territorial disputes. Nine Dash Line and the uh, potential for South China Sea ADIS is something we think about just about every day. The number of uh, 
of territorial disputes starting from the Kuril Islands all the way through the Spratleys and Paracels, uh, down to South Lanconia Shoal, Second Thomas Shoal, Scarborough Reef. You can read about all those uh, challenges uh, with respect to the disputed territory and how they're being solved. The, what the United States continually says, and we say in PACOM, is that any of those, interna any of those disputes need to be solved in an uh, international, uh, peaceful manner under international laws, international rules, and, and through a peaceful resolution. The assertive and aggressive behavior of nations we do not believe is the acceptable way to solve those, and we continue to reiterate that. Uh, again, you can go through all the, uh, all the disputed areas as we, as we walk down there. There's also the new Hainan Fisheries Law that basically takes about 2 million square kilometers in the South China Sea and applies a Hainan Fisheries Law to it, which means that any fisheries that come into there into international waters have to get clearance through the Hainan Fisheries uh, Regulatory Commission. Again, that is outside uh, what is an accepted normal rule of law in international practice. The other challenges we face uh, uh, in the AOR include counter piracy. We have a, a fairly uh, successful to date uh, move in Straits of Malacca with multi-nation uh, support out of Singapore, it's Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and the United States. We have cut down drastically the number of pirate, piracy attacks within the Straits of Malacca, but they still exist, and that's still an ongoing challenge. There's unrest in Bangladesh, which everyone's aware of. There's the emergence of Burma and my, Burma slash Myanmar, and what that's going to look like as they continue to make progress as a stable nation. And of course, the political turmoil that exists in Thailand today between, with uh, the potential for Prim Prime Minister Yingluck being removed, uh, potentially just her or her entire cabinet based on what the Constitutional Court says. On top of that, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the tyranny of distance, uh, the terms we like to use in the Pacific is you can fit every land mass in the planet in the Pacific Ocean and still have room left over for another North American continent and another African continent. It's 17% uh, of the land mass of the world with just about 60% of the world's population, which is a challenge in and of itself. Uh, on top of that, you have the Ring of Fire. It's called that for a reason. It's not a question as if there will be another natural disaster. It's rather when and where and our ability to respond to those, whether it's in Japan, like the Great East Japan uh, earthquake and tsunami, or uh, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, or earthquakes or Indonesia, wherever that occurs. And I guess at the end of this, what I tell you, I've walked through the AOR, is that we have learned and we believe in the United States and certainly in PACOM that as we face these challenges, that we are more required to be closer with our allies and partners. In other words, as, as we face sequestration and budget reductions, as we face this number of challenges and the importance of this part of the world uh, to the future of the United States, in fact, we need to be closer and closer to our allies and partners and friends in the region. We need to engage more. We need to be more forward presence uh, as we continue through this. Next slide. This is, this is going to be a long briefing if we have to wait for all these slides. I have no idea how to make it go to the next slide. Okay, so the, the next slide uh, is uh, one that has uh, several engagements that we're participating in, and I think it goes to the point of... Uh, um, the term, again, something we often use is a statement that virtual presence is actual absence. We've got to be forward in the AOR. We've got to engage. Uh, last year, or this year, in fiscal year uh, 14, about 400 different engagements in the Asia-Pacific region, excuse me, Indo-Asia-Pacific region, uh, and everything we're doing there. The other thing that the picture will depict, you can probably almost see it up there, but if you draw a line from Alaska, uh, down to Anderson, over to Hawaii, back up to Alaska, commonly referred to by us as the strategic <coughs> triangle. It basically, it's U.S. soil that projects into the Pacific that allows us to do uh, power projection, uh, engagement, and everything we need to do as we project that into the Pacific region. We also obviously have permanent bases in Japan and Korea, and then we engage throughout the rest of Asia, and we're moving more and more to the south and southwest as we engage more and more in Asia. You've uh, heard some of the things that have happened recently. We're doing a force posture initiatives uh, engagement with Australia where we'll get a rotational presence there. Uh, we're also, we just defined, uh, signed the enhanced defense cooperation agreement with the Philippines. Uh, we have presence in Singapore that we operate out of. We have a continuous engagement with Thailand um, and we're continuing to do that. And one other thing I'd tell you is it's places, not bases. We're not building any more bases in the Pacific. 
We won't build any more bases in the Pacific, but we will have a rotational presence. Uh, back in the late great days of the Cold War, we had a program called Checkered Flag, where we would take uh, stateside-based units and we'd rotate them into Europe about every 18 months to two years. Uh, we are trying to do that, and we're becoming successful at doing that in the Asia Pacific. About every 18 months to two years, we intend to have just about every unit in CONUS, if we can, rotate through somewhere in the Pacific. And obviously, uh, these are just an example of some of the places we're doing that. Red Flag Alaska, Red Flag Nellis are the high-end exercises. We also have Cope North, trilateral exercise with the Japanese, uh, the Australians, the United States. We also include a humanitarian assistance disaster response in that exercise. The Koreans participated in last year. The Filipinos are going to participate in that. New Zealand's going to participate, and that's growing. Uh, we are continuing those exercises, and we move uh, farther to west. Cobra Gold's the largest um, multi-service exercise the United States conducts. It's in Thailand with many nations. RIMPAC is about to happen out in uh, Hawaii. I think 26 nations are going to participate in that, to include the People's Republic of China. We'll participate in RIMPAC uh, in, uh, in July of this year. Uh, and then Cope Taufan uh, with Indonesia, we do Cope South, we do Cope India with the Indians, and we continue to move out. So the exercise, right now, to date, we've done about 185 uh, for this year, fiscal year, and we have about 200 left as we move on. Next slide. So, <laughs> this slide worked. Well done. <clears throat> you might get promoted now. I think. <laughs> You're doing good, Train. Thanks. Uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this is what we call in PACAF, we call it the 3 by 5 the PACAF strategy. If you look at the far right of that uh, slide, uh, the objectives that our national command authorities give us, what Admiral Lockler expects me to do for him is be ready to do all those things. Contingency ops, free access to international environments, both air and maritime, uh, stability, uh, prosperity, uh, and security in the region, deter aggression, and when called upon, respond to defend United States interests and our allies. We use those five lines of operation as a uh, senior airman in the Pacific. I kind of wear four hats. I'm the air, uh, Joint uh, Force Air Component Commander, which means everything that flies within the Pacific Theater is under the JFAC or the Joint uh, Force Air Component Commander. I also have the role of the Area Air Defense Commander, which means 52% of the world's surface is I'm responsible to, for defending uh, in, as an Area Air Defense Commander. Uh, which is one of our biggest challenges, you might imagine. Space Control Authority and Airspace Control Authority. So those five lines going across, those five lines of operation, as we call them, or lose, are the five things that I have to be able to do every day in order to meet uh, what the National Command Authorities and what Admiral Lockler expects me to do. Theater Security Cooperation is just what you would expect. It's engagement. It's phase zero. It's building partnerships, building relationships. It's all those things you do to maintain access, maintain uh, uh, good relations, and maintain the ability to interoperate with our friends, partners, and allies. Integrated air and missile defense goes directly to the area air defense commander role. And I will tell you, it's one that bothers me every day. Uh, the largest missile arsenals in the world are Russia, China, and North Korea in that order. And most of them are pointed at either us or our friends and allies. And so our ability to defend against a potential missile attack is one that is hugely a challenge. And you can see that when you look at what North Korea does even today with respect to their growing missile arsenal. Power projection is exactly that. It's our ability to do global vigilance, global reach, and global power anywhere in the world. And my ability to do it in that 52% of the world's surface is to get whatever kind of asset I need in place in hours, not days, to be able to provide uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, to be able to provide mobility, humanitarian assistance, disaster response, and if called upon to put power projection capability into that theater in the way of global power. Agile Flexible C2 is the other challenge I think I, talk, I think about just about every day. For the last decade and a half, the United States hasn't really had to worry about command and control of our forces. If you look at what we've done in Iraq and Afghanistan, everything more than about 80 feet off the ground we've owned and we've been, been able to do anything we want. Unfortunately, in my AOR, that's not the case. We'll be contested in a variety of ways. We'll be contested just for the start by the paucity of assets that exist in that theater. There are no, the number of comm satellites that exist in the Asia Pacific region is paltry compared to anywhere else in the world. You add on top of that cyber attacks, denied communications, contested, denied, and degraded environments, and the ability to command and control. So how do you do flexible uh, command and control? How do you go from centralized command to distributed control? 
or you go down to nodes to control the forces that you have in the field. And then how do you uh, then do decentralized execution to meet the commander's intent and stay inside the decision loop of your adversary or potential adversary that you can operate faster than he can. And then finally, uh, the last line of operation is our incredible airmen. 45,000 airmen that exist in the Pacific Theater, I will tell you they're the greatest asset this nation has. If you want to gain faith in America or America's youth, just walk out to the flight lines, the shops, the offices. They're incredible, and they will dazzle you every day. My job in life is to make sure they're taken care of, and everything I can do to make sure them and their families are taken care of, and that's the final line of operation that we have in the Pacific. Uh, on the left-hand side is the ways that we go about doing that. So expand engagement, uh, again, is just that. It's kind of the heart of theater security cooperation. It's our ability to engage. It's forward presence. It's, it's key leader engagements. It's uh, uh, training exercises. It's subject matter expert exchange. It's interoperability. It's ability to do all those things. Uh, in time of sequestration, increase in combat capability is hard. So how do you do that? It means that every single dollar you spend, you have to make sure that it is the dollar that's going to give you the most capability because you may not have another dollar to spend. Today, I believe that we have more mission than we have money, manpower, or time, and it's going to stay that way, as I see it, for the foreseeable future. So our ability to focus our efforts to get the most out of everything we're doing with our airmen and with our money and with the time that we invest has got to be to give us the greatest capability. And then finally, the integration, warfighter integration is, for the Air Force, it's airspace and cyber, and how do we integrate those three across all of them? It is across the joint force. How do we do air-sea battle? How do we do integrated air and missile defense? How do we take the advantage of the stealth-type platforms like submarines and F-22s and F-35s and combine them with higher visibility platforms and get the most combat capable we can po possibly get? And it's integration amongst us and our allies. When the uh, Australians buy, with their buying the P-8 Triton, the F-35, as well as uh, they just, uh, they've also announced that they're going to buy uh, 58 F-35s, the, the Japanese are going to buy them. So how do you integrate with those partners? And then how do you bring the lower capability partners, the Philippines, to the greatest capability? You can, can integrate and operate with them at the same time. Next slide. So uh, I know uh, we'll, we'll get to questions here shortly. I'll go through these fairly quickly. I know watching people's travel photos is not everybody's greatest uh, <coughs> uh, uh, time. I, you probably don't want to do this. But I'll go through just a couple of pictures of some things we've done. Um, and I think it is, uh, it's indicative of the engagements that we're doing in the Asia Pacific. This is uh, General Welsh and myself. We uh, visited uh, China back in the fall of this year. It's the first chief of staff visit to uh, China for 15 years. 1998 was the last time. And that's the chief sitting in a J-10. Uh, it was a great engagement. Uh, it was uh, enlightening. It was constructive. It was substantive. Uh, it was uh, enlightening. I'd been in China in 2009, and I hadn't been back since, so four years later. And I will tell you folks, I was dazzled by the change. It, it was amazing. The, the, there, if there's any doubt in anybody's mind that China is on the rise, there shouldn't be, because it definitely is. And it was obvious in, in the way they conducted themselves, and we got to see a lot of their military operations, and just in the, in the cities that we visited writ large. There's also a level of confidence. And I think probably an extremely high level of confidence by the, the PRC, their military, and their civilian leadership. We did have a chance to meet both uh, General Ma, the head of the Air Force, and the Vice uh, Central Military Commission, one of the vices of the Central Military Commission, the former chief of the Air Force, General uh, Xu. So it, it was a very substantial visit. Uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, we all walked away saying that the military forces of China and the United States have the opportunity to operate significantly more in close proximity to each other in the future, and that will only grow over time. Uh, the opportunity for miscalculation is great, and our ability to deal with that, to deal with those frictions, we must and can do a better job of managing that friction because the potential <coughs> exists there for uh, something bad to happen. Uh, and we don't want uh, something like another P3 in the Hainan Island uh, incident that happened before. So it was a great visit. We got to visit many places, got to go to see a lot, quite a bit of their equipment, spend a lot of time with their military. And again, it was, it was obvious uh, that the nation is doing ex exceedingly well. Next slide. Obviously, uh, Australia is uh, our close partner. We fought side by side with the Australians since World War I, and we still are today. Uh, it is an amazing relationship. Uh, again, the, just if you look at what their interoperability was and what they're procuring for their nation, their ability to operate. Uh, Benny Binskin has just been named. He's an airman as the new chief of defense force for Australia, and Jeff Brown's been extended for years. They're chief of the uh, Air Force. 
that's all great news for the United States, both great folks and a great relationship with the United States. Uh, I went to the Air Power Symposium. This is the Air Power Symposium we went to. It was fantastic. Uh, many nations were represented there, all of our allies uh, and uh, many of our friends and partners from throughout the region. It was uh, incredibly valuable. Uh, that picture in the lower right-hand corner is kind of a neat story. Those, uh, those are a set of twins uh, from a guy named Flight Officer Mobsby. He was an Australian RAF pilot that flew with the 90th Squadron, a U.S. Squadron, B-26s out of Papua New Guinea uh, in World War II. He was killed in a very dangerous flight. Um, the rest of the flight got silver stars. He did not. His uh, family kept up the uh, petition for that, and uh, I was able to award the silver star to his two daughters. They never met their father. He was, uh, or they don't remember him. Uh, they were born about six months after he deployed, so pretty neat story. But the relationship with Australia is as strong as it's ever been and growing stronger all the time. Next slide. I uh, got to go to Vietnam, uh, went to Hanoi, Da Nang, and then Saigon slash Ho Chi Minh City. They still call it Saigon, by the way. Uh, they don't call it Ho Chi Minh City very often, uh, but they use both names interchangeably. It was a great visit. I will tell you that uh, General Hua, the chief of staff of their Air Force, uh, very open and welcoming the entire country was. Uh, they, uh, they were uh, uh, noticeably appreciative of our efforts to engage with them. There are legal ramifications. There's things we have to watch by law with what we can do with the Vietnamese. There's many areas where we can grow that, grow that relationship. Uh, and uh, it, it was, it was in incredibly productive. Uh, we are looking at a couple of things using some of the mobility assets and flying through Da Nang. There's some training environments that we're, we're looking at potentially being able to help them with. That picture on the right is a Pacific Angel. We do those four or five times a year. We've done them in, uh, in Vietnam in 2009, 10, 12, and 13. Pacific Angels are events where we take uh, doctors, uh, uh, dentists, veterinarians, engineering capability, and we go to a place that needs some help. We do uh, a huge medical uh, engagement. We do engineering engagement, and probably as valuable is we bring in the, the host nation's military and government officials to increase their visibility with their own population. So it's very valuable and has a, a positive response. Next slide. Uh, Thailand, obviously another of our treaty allies, five of seven treaty allies the United States have are in the Asia Pacific region, Japan, Korea, Australia, Philippines, Thailand. This is the Endocope Tiger. It's a trilateral exercise with Singapore, the United States, and Thailand. Uh, again, hugely successful. It's been going on since 1994. We also have a very big one that I mentioned earlier, and that's Cope North with the Japanese and Australians in, in, uh, in Anderson. Next slide. And finally, this is the Pacific Air Chiefs Symposium. We uh, had 14 Pacific Air Chiefs that met me in Hawaii, then we traveled throughout the United States. It's uh, General uh, Welsh is the host of it, and I get to escort them throughout the United States. Incredibly valuable. Uh, again, 14 Air Chiefs from throughout the region. Uh, the picture in the upper right-hand corner is at the USS Arizona. Uh, down in the lower left is the Boneyard in uh, Davis Montem and then F-35 at Eglin. But uh, it, uh, it, tremendous uh, engagement, tremendous opportunity to spend time with these Air Chiefs, hear their problems and spend time with them. And I think at the end of this, what I would tell everyone in the kind of the thesis or the basis of this whole talk is, as we face problems, budgetary problems that we have, and we see sequestration of those things, in fact, our relationship with our friends and partners and allies has got to get closer. We have to pull them closer and get greater understanding of each other's challenges and issues and become more and more interoperable and integrate our forces closer and closer as we move forward. Next slide. So the uh, takeaways I'll, I'll leave you with and then uh, be more than happy, and I look forward to answering your questions. The, uh, the rebalance in the Pacific, uh, it, it's, uh, it's alive and well. I, I think um, I know people talk about is it actually happening during sequestration? Did it happen? Yeah, it happened. It, it is. I think the amount of engagement we're doing uh, is gone up drastically. Uh, it is the effort, uh, the emphasis, whether it's the president's trip, Secretary Hagel, Secretary Kerry, it's uh, Admiral Locklear and his moves throughout the AOR, it is certainly an active and the rebalance is fully engaged. It's, we were slowed down by sequestration, frankly, I will tell you in 13 we had to cancel some exercises that cost us uh, terribly. We had to cancel an exercise in which the red flag Nellis that the Indians were going to participate in and that was a devastating blow to me, I will tell you, and it was uh, something that 
Uh, we regret uh, still, but we have made it up. They're going to participate uh, in FY15, um, and, they, uh, and so we're, we're continuing. I think we've managed it uh, as best we could, and as we went into 14, uh, we were able to go back to kind of the full engagement, uh, uh, the full engagement scenario and the full engagement uh, setup. We had to shrink footprint a little bit just because of the, of the reduction in budget. Overall, I think it's going well. The key to this whole thing is relationships. It's about building those relationships. When we talk theater security cooperation, it's all of that. It's, uh, it's from subject matter expert exchange to key leader engagement to exercises on the grand scale to smaller exercises to everything we can do. So with that, next slide, I think that's it. That's questions, and I uh, appreciate your attention. I told Dave, David before this that I hoped uh, that I finish speaking before you qu finish listening. I hope that worked out for you. And uh, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. So while they're moving the podium back, if you have written questions, raise your card up. We've got staff. Actually, it's probably the guys moving the podium. But as soon as they're finished moving the podium, they'll come pick up your questions and, and get them up to us. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Green. Um, thank you, General. <clears throat> thank you all for your patience um, with our technology. We will be posting uh, the General's slides on the CSIS website, www.csis.org. Um, that was a very robust and, uh, and busy. Or too long. Um, no, 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 no. Robust and busy and concise um, agenda for engagement. And it prompted me to ask a, first, if I could, a, a, a broad question about the, the culture of the Air Force and the philosophy of the Air Force. Because historically, in my view, the Air Force has sometimes sent mixed signals. <clears throat> in the 90s, you had this idea of elegant presence. When I was in the uh, NSC, there was the idea of deep strike. So it, it, at times, historically, it seems like the Air Force has um, approached forward presence and engagement a little more, with a little more distance than some of the other services. But what you're describing is quite different. So I wonder if you could put it in some historical context for where you see the Air Force overall as it thinks about the Pacific. Uh, yeah, I'd be more than happy to. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll kind of go to my history and what I grew up with and then where I see it today. And it's kind of what I mentioned with the checkered flag mentality. When I was, you know, there's, there's some of us in here that were part of our Air Force during the late great days of the Cold War. Um, but, you know, we, uh, I was stationed at Holloman, I was stationed at Eglin, I was stationed at Langley, and we rotated through Europe continuously. Uh, and it was called checkered flag. It was to figure out where your forward operating location was and what would happen when the great fold gap uh, war occurred and how we'd respond to that. And air power was a key component to that, obviously. Well, the Pacific is kind of, we're taking that same kind of model in some ways in that uh, it's, it's more about engagement, it's more about security and stability, and it's more about forward presence and goes to that actual presence, not virtual presence. So um, no more places, I, I mean, no more bases, but more places. So our ability to go operate out of uh, pick a couple of places in the Philippines, QB Point or uh, Clark. Our ability to go operate out of Pailabar in Singapore, our ability to operate out of Karat in Thailand. It's that rotational presence. And uh, I, I think you'll see, uh, we know Europe, uh, the drawdown in Europe, I believe that's as small as it could possibly go. I don't think it can get any smaller. Uh, the Middle East, there'll be presence there for a long time, forward presence there for a long time, certainly as we see it in the foreseeable future. At, at, our, at the main bases that we're operating out today out of the, out of the Middle East. And in, in uh, Asia, Indo Asia Pacific, it's the same thing. I think our presence there, the bases we have, will maintain the newest technology as they have uh, so far. The newest stuff, when it shows up, it goes to the Pacific. Uh, those bases will stay, stay at the robust state that they're at now. As I believe they will, and certainly in the foreseeable future. And then we'll continue that rotational presence. And we'll, can, we do it today with theater security packages and continuous bomber presence. We'll do the same thing in the future. So you'll see um, the Expeditionary Air Force is, uh, is one that we've, you know, post-1991, uh, post we've been working continuously. We've had some, some hiccups with it. We, it hasn't always gone exactly like it should. But the Expeditionary Air Force and our ability to get out of town and get someplace rapidly and operate there is one that we're continuing to expand on. And it's certainly viable in the Asia Pacific. And part of that is tyranny of distance alone. I, you know, I, and, I, and I love my Navy brethren. They do incredibly great things for us. But they travel in days that we travel in hours. So when you're talking about that size AOR, you have to be there rapidly. And the ability to respond the hours makes a difference. Let me, <clears throat> let me try to 
put a little fuel in that inter service rivalry and, and, uh, and, and note that Admiral Greenert at the Western Pacific Naval Symposium um, with his colleagues reached what could be a significant agreement on how to handle uh, unintended, unexpected um, incidents at sea. Uh, the PLA Navy um, announced that it doesn't cover the East and South China Seas before the ink was dry, but still, that was a pretty, uh, pretty uh, impressive outcome for the Western Naval Symposium. <clears throat> um, for the Pacific Air Chiefs, and as you look at your engagement, um, what kind of confidence building measures could you foresee uh, coming out of these kinds of discussions, particularly since, as you noted, um, in the East China Sea, we're talking seconds in the air, not minutes, days, or, or hours, as we would with Coast Guards or Navy. Well, there's a couple things, and I think part of it is, uh, and this is part of the reason we're in China, is that interaction to, and it was a constructive visit, and, and you know, in many ways, I think the PRC is very open to some of these discussions. Uh, but uh, when you look at what happens in the eight is today with, uh, and whether it's not LRA from the Russians or it's a scramble in response uh, by the PRC, uh, you know, there's cases where we have many airplanes in close proximity. There was a point last year uh, up off the peninsula, off the Korean peninsula, where uh, we had uh, air forces from North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and the United States, and they were all within close proximity. Unfortunately, the only people that knew who everybody was was us. Um, and part of that's that uh, sharing, information sharing. We're trying to work on that to increase that information sharing uh, so that we have a common picture. That's one way that we can start addressing some of that is try to continue to work on that common picture uh, and the information sharing with respect to what's going on. And then confidence building maneuvers is uh, engagement, interoperability, uh, it's uh, the potential for hotlines, which is some of the ones that have been talked about. It's notification for something out of the ordinary or exercises, things that's going to happen. So all of those are things we're working on to increase uh, the understanding, because there is a high potential for miscalculation, and that's one of the things that is very concerning to us. Good, thank you. <clears throat> you posed the question in your presentation, how do we integrate with our allies and partners, particularly as high-end partners like Japan and Australia are integrating F-35, high-end partners are doing missile defense. These are more expensive. The depot and maintenance is more uh, complicated and expensive. <clears throat> the interoperability and link is, links are more, more important. Um, so you posed the question. I wanted to throw it back at you uh, and ask, how do we, uh, or how do you foresee integrating uh, these different alliances and partnerships, recognizing their political sensitivities? These are all bilateral alliances. Right. But the, the capabilities <clears throat> are becoming uh, right. networked or should be networked. Well, I think, uh, I think one thing we're working hard on is going from bilateral to multilateral. So that's part of it. Uh, we had a, you know, we have the red flags where we'll get multiple nations in the recent past. Last year we had very successful uh, red flag uh, where we had uh, the Republic of Korea and Japan were both there. The, the Republic of Korea deployed fighters off of the peninsula for an exercise for the first time in their history. Uh, uh, hugely successful. As a matter of fact, we had all three command and control platforms operating together, which is unheard of for uh, presenting the, the picture. So uh, very successful in that respect. I think um, the equipment interoperability is one that uh, in some cases is a challenge. We're getting better at that. I think some of the most recent announcements from some nations and the kind of equipment they're going to procure, uh, that makes it easier. Uh, I think it's uh, the symposiums, we get a lot of understanding and also some of the uh, information passing uh, in the exercises for how you can, it, it's great to talk about it, but to actually exercise and go out and try to do it. And we do that in Cope Tiger with Thailand and Singapore. We do it in Cope North with uh, Japan and Australia. Uh, we do it in Max Thunder with the Republic of Korea in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we do it, we, we've had some integrated air and missile defense exercise with the Japanese where we've worked, looked at that interoperability and that information sharing. Uh, so it, it's, uh, it's a continuous process. You never finish. You have to keep working at it. I think that's probably, you can never say we're interoperable. That doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. You always have to work at it and continue to do it. Uh, but I think some of the things we're doing with respect to engagements, key leader engagements, exercises, war games, uh, we're getting better and better at it as we go forward. We, uh, <clears throat> if I can engage in a brief moment of self-advertising, we have a project here at CSIS across our defense, security, and regional programs looking at what John Hamry calls federated defense. When your budgets aren't growing, when the technology is more complicated, uh, when you have countries like Japan relaxing their 
sort of out of date um, export control rules, countries like Australia or India are interested in doing more with Japan <coughs> or, and with Korea and with other, you have an opportunity there to get more uh, deterrence um, for your money <coughs> and jointness and interoperability uh, combined capabilities are, are, are deterrents. Um, and, and our thought is it even expands beyond that to confidence building when you start focusing on interoperability, interoperability as, as you said. Do we have some card questions ready? <clears throat> the questions have been pouring in, so including those from viewers on the web. So I'm going to merge a few together into a multiple set, if you will. Okay. Uh, the first, actually, there's a whole series of questions about China and your comments about how rapidly they've moved forward and how we engage with them, et cetera. But their questions sort of tend to fall down. Are they really ex an expansionist power or in fact are they sticking with a, as a regional uh, guard their flank sort of thing? What do you look for in terms of the signals? Because clearly we have to prepare for either way. What do you look for in terms of signals they send, including for instance, what would be your response to the creation of a second ADIZ over the South China Sea? That's not the whole point of the question. It's really the broader. Um, what do you look for from expansionist tendencies versus uh, cooperative tendencies? Um, well, I think uh, there's a couple things that I'd talk about. First of all, there is, if you look at the declaration of the East China Sea aid is, um, you look at the development of their aircraft carrier, the CV-16, you look at their uh, mission action, some of the exercises they've done uh, that have gone significantly farther out uh, to what they call the second island chain. The first island chain obviously being uh, the closer in one, the second <coughs> island chain out farther. So, and they've continued to expand their ability to operate farther and farther away. So th we see that all the time. Same thing in the South China Sea uh, with their ability to operate farther and farther south. I think the territorial disputes and the way that they're, they're being handled is one uh, that is that we have concern over. Uh, I think the, the nine dash line uh, the ability to solve that in a peaceful manner uh, within international law and international norms, that's one that uh, clearly we th think about. Uh, we haven't really seen, uh, I, and I'm not a lawyer, so I won't make any comments, but uh, the legal basis for their nine-dash line, I, I'm not sure that uh, a lot of people understand where their legal basis is or if it exists there. So with respect to that, uh, there is an, a, a look that China is continuing to move to be able to uh, solve those disputed uh, islands, Senkaku's, Diaoyu, is the same thing. Uh, so that part of it is concerning uh, with respect to what they're doing. On the same hand, their engagement is, is they are participating in RIMPAC this year. Uh, they, did, uh, they, they just had the Western uh, Naval Symposium. Uh, they've just, uh, they, so they are engaging, and I think, you know, I, I think the, the issue for us is our ability, uh, and they talk about it with the, the type of relationship the United States and the PRC has, and that is that, uh, you know, an existing uh, world power and a rising power, and how do, you inter how do you operate together and solve disputes in a peaceful manner uh, under international law and international norms. So I think there are indications that they are continuing to try to solve those in uh, an aggressive, assertive way that we would not agree with. Uh, some of the things they've done uh, in relation to both Malaysia and the Philippines would be disconcerting, and uh, we're, we, don't, we think that's the wrong way to go. And then there's other cases where they engage and things uh, are handled in a, in a more appropriate way. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's kind of the national strategy with China, which I'm not sure uh, I mean, that's a, it, I'm not sure how you would answer what the, the true United States national strategy is with respect to the PRC. So there is, a, there is kind of a, a case where we're looking at both sides of that challenge, is that there is some kind of movement to territorial gain. I'm going to, again, merge a number of questions together, and you can take them as you wish. One is uh, Dr. Green referred to a lot of bilateral engagements as well, and most of your examples were sort of bilateral in their, in their description. Um, but there's probably in federated defense and other ways an opportunity for trilateral, multilateral operations as well. So one is how are you and Pacific Air Forces thinking at a multilateral level or trilateral level? The second is, as you surveyed the region, 
there's one big country that you didn't mention at all. Now, technically, it's not inside your AOR, but it's got an awful long Pacific boundary, and that, of course, is Russia. So talk a little bit about how you calculate Russia into your, into your thinking as well. Yeah, um, I think, uh, maybe I didn't uh, talk about it enough, but our, our going from bilateral to multilateral is, we're doing, we're working very hard on that. Cope North is one at Anderson right now. It's Japanese, Australians, and the U.S. On the HADR portion, the humanitarian assistance disaster response, the Koreans are now, the Republic of Korea is now participating, New Zealand's participating. We'll probably have the Philippines participate next year. Uh, Cope Tiger is Singapore, Thailand, and the United States. Uh, as I mentioned, Red Flag Alaska, we had the Republic of Korea, Japan, the United States, and Australia there, as well as us. Um, Red Flag Nellis, we're having significant larger exercises. Uh, so Pitch Black, we're going to participate with Australia and Pitch Black with uh, F-15Es, and they're going to be folks uh, uh, from many nations there, I think, to include Singapore and Thailand and Indonesia, I believe. Uh, so we're working very hard on the multilateral, and I, the federated defense, is, and you've heard General Welsh talk about it, as we face the challenges we face in the future, our, we have to pull our friends closer uh, and, and rely more on that uh, ability to operate together and to do things together. So I think we're making good positive uh, uh, response uh, on that. Um, the uh, the s second question was... I, I, I talked about the long-range aviation and what they're doing there. Um, they are becoming increasingly uh, active in the Pacific, and they do have a long, as a matter of fact, it, it's not an RAOR, but it is, because we think about it all the time. Uh, we have forces in Alaska, the closest point of approach between the United States and Russia, and, and how we operate up there with our uh, uh, Alaska NORAD region. Um, and what we're doing uh, with the, as they continue to uh, expand uh, into the Asia Pacific, there are things that are concerning uh, with respect to how they, how they operate and how uh, transparent they are with, with other nations in the vicinity. Uh, Japan's doing uh, some engagement, and I think they have some positive momentum. Um, but it's something that we, we basically consider the... Russia, I mean, we deal with it as part of our area of responsibility uh, just because of that Pacific boundary and they are there. There are concerns, and, and I will tell you that what's happening in the Ukraine today is causing some significant uh, um, concerns in the Asia, in, in Indo Asia Pacific. How do you respond to those concerns? Um, I, I, you know, I think it's, uh, it, it's twofold. One is uh, there's, uh, there's the Fairly, the very aggressive act by the Russia on the Crimea and what they're doing in eastern Ukraine. For many nations that have territorial disputes or internal unrest, I mean, PRC being one, they have unrest challenges they face in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in, in Taiwan. So uh, in some ways, that's disconcerting to them uh, because of internal unrest. And then in other ways, uh, quote unquote, the ability to take what's, what they believe is rightfully theirs in some method other than uh, under international law, then that's something that's concerning on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the belief in what Admiral Locklear and all of us do is spend more and more time reassuring allies that uh, cooperative uh, defense, our ability to operate together, our ability to build security and stability is really dependent upon how well we work together and how well we engage as, as, a, as teammates as we go forward. So. Uh, Predominantly, when we respond, it's we'll be we're here. We've always been here. We'll continue to be here, and we'll continue to operate with you and work together as uh, as partners. You, you mentioned the getting the exercises back on track after some hiccups as a result of sequestration in fiscal year 13. Historically, one of the big lessons that comes out of exercises is lessons about logistics, and no theater faces logistics challenges like you do in, in the Pacific. So what are your big concerns about logistics? What roles can our allies and partners play in helping the logistics? And then what happens if things like the lower number of the FIDIP come to pass and we don't have KC-10s? So that just complicates things even further. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the lesson of logistics is not lost on anybody, in, in my opinion, and certainly nobody in the Air Force, because the ability to supply uh, the forward force to engage is one that y you have to have the logistics trained to be able to support that. 
Uh, and the biggest concern for me, obviously, is the tyranny of distance is one of them, and the other part of it is uh, command and control of those logistics capability, because you know those uh, networks uh, potentially can be degraded, denied, disrupted, uh, and deceived. And so our ability to operate the command and control of logistics and then have the ability to move it forward. Part of it is that uh, interoperability with our friends, partners, and allies and how we, how we potentially forward position things. One of the things uh, as a result of the enhanced defense cooperation agreement with the Philippines is to put humanitarian assistance disaster response supplies forward, which you know, that's, that's a, that's a na nature-made disaster that has the same problems. If, if you remember during the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami, calm was shut off to the Korean Peninsula because of the fiber uh, that was broken. So that can happen for a variety of reasons. It can happen by ill intent or it can happen by natural disaster. So command and control of that, uh, the logistics chain and how you do that. Uh, Again, I think agility, and that's why we talk about agile, flexible command and control. That's also, we have to talk about agile, flexible logistics and our ability to put stuff in the right place and interoperability with friends and partners is part of that. Uh, our, our closest allies, uh, certainly our treaty partners as, uh, as well as uh, other nations in AOR, but Australia, Japan, Korea, Singapore, uh, Thailand, some of those are very close in our ability to, to operate the logistics with their aid and, and as we work as a team, that, that's going to be part of the solution. But command and control is one of the things that I think about most when it comes to, to logistics. Your, your raising of the uh, Philippines agreement uh, that was announced last week brings into question some of the broader issues of d dispersal as a tactic and, uh, and hardening as a preparation, if you will. I think you've referred to that in the past as resiliency. Um, you know, how do you describe your thoughts on resiliency and, and how your strategy uh, on resiliency works with engagement as well as with, uh, with uh, planning? Well, I, I think it's, uh, they're hand in hand. Resiliency in our engagement, our access is part of that uh, discussion. The, the basic premise, obviously, is that if you have a few number with a large concentration of capability, those become vulnerabilities. So in the past, if you had a huge amount of force at Anderson and a huge amount of force at Kadena, uh, those two, the, the, they, that becomes a vulnerability. Um, so the ability to disperse and, and move forces throughout the theater, if required, for whatever case you're responding to, uh, gives you more flexibility. It also removes some of those vulnerabilities of large concentrations, tremendously large concentrations, small area. Now, there's a balance there as well, because every, every place you, you are, you have to also be able to support logistically and defend. Uh, so uh, the resiliency is the ability to move things to uh, multiple locations while at the same time being able to defend them and support them logistically. And that's a balance that, uh, so it's, you, you don't, you know, put one airplane at 72, one single airplane at 72 different locations, so you have three squadrons of airplanes, but you probably don't put 180 at one place necessarily either. So it's that ability to move them out. And it is, the resiliency piece is there's a, Passive defense, which is that ability to move out, it's hardening, it's, uh, dis it's runway repair, it's uh, fuel storage, and then it's also your ability to, uh, to move stuff and, and support that. Can I ask you, <clears throat> while we're piling the hard problems on, <clears throat> can I ask you uh, generally to say something about cyber and space? How does a regional component commander um, develop strategies and operational concepts and so forth <clears throat> for what is you know, we're two problems, space and cyber, that don't really know boundaries where attribution can be hard in the cyber case. <clears throat> um, there's a lot of it about what you do with allies and partners. Um, can you say a bit more about how in a regional context you deal with these sort of problems that know no boundaries and they're in different domains? <clears throat> it, we're working hard on it and some of it is developing over time. One is uh, Cybercom and what uh, General Alexander did and, uh, and Major General Williams and those folks in, in, in presenting what's called the Cyber Command and Control model for the Department of Defense as it interacts with uh, other departments within the U.S. government. So there's, it, it, is a, it is a complex man-made domain that we have to figure out how to operate in. And, and if you talk cyber, there's, there's Doden Ops, the ability to support your own networks, there's ability to defend yourself, and then there's offensive either soft kill or hard kill, kinetic or non-kinetic type of attacks you can do in the cyber domain. So all of that uh, is overlaid by authorities you have and don't have. So uh, when, when, 
when Sam Locklear sits down with his what's called Cyber Pact, the Pacific Cyber Element, and the Cyber Support Elements, CSEs, that operate within each one of those components, then we start building our ability to uh, predominantly defend our own uh, capability, our own command and control capability, which includes to some extent reaching out, getting out beyond our boundaries to see what's out there before it gets to our boundaries. So it's, it's defensive, but it has some offensive uh, mindset to it in a way, at least in trying to figure out what's out there. And then uh, our ability to deny a potential adversary his ability to use that, and that is cases which, within, which are within the authority of a COCOM combatant command and ones that are not. And then there's active cyber that you're going to go out and take out other portions uh, and how you operate that. Um, it's incredibly difficult as a nation for us to figure that out, and certainly as a combatant command. I will tell you that, in my opinion, on the international front, working with allies and partners, it becomes a, an order of magnitude more difficult because of authorities. In some of our closest allies, we, you know, and there's very few of those in the Five Eyes, for example, we are working those issues, but it, it is the cyber discussion is a huge challenge. Do you want to do? You mentioned also uh, shortages in ISR, and uh, although I don't think you used the word shortages, but challenges in ISR capability, if you will. Um, what are you doing across there, and in particular, what role does Global Hawks uh, play, in, uh, both for U.S. and Japan, and how's that going? Well, it, it's going well. The Global Hawk is, a, is the assets doing great. It's uh, moving to Misawa at the end of this month and at the end of May. And it's going to operate out of Misawa to get out of the typhoon belt uh, for the summertime. Uh, we think we'll probably get 60 to 70 percent greater utilization by, by moving and operating out of Misawa. Uh, there's other nations that are interested in either buying them or looking at them. And obviously, the, the Australians just uh, uh, announced that they're going to buy the Triton, uh, the uh, BAMS, or the Broad Area Maritime Surveillance equivalent of that. Uh, it's a key component, but the rivet joints are a key component, the J-STARs are key component. The U-2, in fact, is a key component of that. So it, it's, I will tell you, across the board, and certainly with uh, Sam Locklear and the Pacific Command, if, if they had one more dollar to spend, they would go out and buy ISR. If we get relief in anywhere, they'll go and buy more ISR, because that's the thing they feel like they have the least of. We are getting better at using all the capability we have. We have a J-STARS in the Pacific for the first time for the entire year this year. Uh, P8s are in theater now, which is fantastic. Uh, P3 and EP3, and to include the LSRS, all of those capabilities are being integrated. We're doing some great work uh, with our ability to use multiple platforms together in what we call cross-queuing. Uh, so we're getting better at it, uh, and we're trying to take advantage of every little piece we have, but we never have enough. You have a heck of a job. <laughs> You're trying to understand where technology is going and marry that to a region where a lot of us who spend a lot of time in the region are trying to figure out where the region's going. Uh, but it sounds like a comprehensive strategy, and we wish you the best of luck and very much appreciate your joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Michael.